Hey, what's going on, guys? John here. Welcome back to another episode of One of Each. From wherever you guys are tuning in from across the world, I hope you guys are doing well. Today's episode, as you can tell by the title of this video, is a conversation that I had with our very own Mr. J. Mahdi. Now, I believe Mahdi stands for Modder's Head. Don't quote me on that. It definitely isn't Mahdi. I think Mahdi is the abbreviated version, uh, as our British uh, brothers always like to abbreviate and shorten things, kind of like Korea in, in many ways. But regardless of what his government name might be, we know him and love him as our very own Jay Mahdi. Now, Jay, in the list of motivational, inspirational heroes in my life, Jay is certainly up there with the best. And, you know, Jay might not be somebody that played in the MLS like Jimmy Conrad. Jay might not be one of the greatest comedians in the world like Dave Chappelle. Jay might not be a Korean player that played in at Manchester United under Sir Alex Ferguson like Ji Sung Park. But Jay is somebody that's ordinary and extraordinary. And the reason why I say that is because I think Jay, above all else, excels at being a man, a friend, and a father. Uh, and of course, you know, in the world of sports content media and, and, and media in general, social media in general, you don't really share your personal life and you don't really share many of these things that are close to your chest. Some people like to keep it really tight. Some people like to spread it out as wide as the, uh, as the eye can see. But regardless of how much Jay likes to share, what I do know with Jay, and you can, as you can tell by some of the conversations that uh, you'll be listening to, Jay is somebody that hasn't really had the easiest of uh, walks of life. And, you know, and I'm not trying to, you know, diminish your difficulties, your traumas, neither is he, neither am I trying to diminish my own difficulties or trauma. But Jay has had his own share of troubles and difficulties in his life. And for me, uh, Jay might disagree with this, but for me, he overcame those difficulties. He overcame those, uh, those challenges. And above all else, he rose above that. And I think something as difficult as something as challenging as what Jay went through and endured, uh, I think it speaks volumes to the character and testament of somebody like Jay Mahdi. Um, and I really wish my platform was bigger because I really would love to shout this from the rooftops and shout this on, on top of the mountain and, and share with everybody as to how amazing and, and and quite honestly, how brilliant Jay is. Uh, you know, we talked we talk a bit about football, but this conversation, like in the series one of each, it kind of veers a bit away from the footballing aspect, and we just focus a bit more on humanity. We focus a bit on a bit more on what it means to be human. You know, as as per the uh, the previous show that got that got canceled. But uh, <laughs> but anyways, Jay is uh, amazing. We had a great conversation. I mean, I can sit down and talk to Jay for hours and I think he'll keep me laughing all the time and the brilliant thing is, is Jay doesn't even try to make you laugh he just he's just a funny guy to begin with um we talk a bit about uh, his life but we also talk a bit about him potentially coming to New York as well as the entire Paddock family I'm gonna say this again y'all need to come to New York because I will my bed is yours my couch is yours my room is yours you guys can take over and I will New York City is going to be yours. <laughs> All right, well, that's enough for me. We're going to go straight into the episode. Hope you guys enjoy it. Make sure you guys subscribe to the channel if you guys have not yet done so. Hit that notification bell so you guys are always staying up to date on whenever I'm dropping stuff like this. You know, maybe some other stuff like, you know, other silly videos. But other than that, hope you guys enjoy this one. And um, yeah, I'll see you in a bit. All right, here we go. Welcome, 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 Jay. How are you, my man? I'm good, man. It's good to do a video. I don't feel like I've not done a video with you for ages, man. It feels like it's been about a year. It's probably not been that long. It's probably been a couple of months. But yeah, it's good to get back. I need my John Shin fix. I always need a John Shin fix, man. Come on. Uh, you know, uh, you know. after the trip to Manchester, I realized how much I enjoy being around your presence. Uh, you and Joe and Steve and the lads in Manchester, it was... The vibes are just too immaculate. The vibes are too fun for me not to uh, get my own fix of the, the Paddock family. But um, I just want to actually take this moment to thank you guys because being able to go to Manchester and experience that whole uh, that whole vibe of being in a studio, talking about the football team that I love, talking about things like that, I just felt like that was such an amazing, fun time for me. Because I, when I first visited Manchester, I, I, don't, I don't think I had the time to be able to visit the first studio that we were at back when... Um, Back when Paddock was a full-time Devils, but but now that that was fun. 
That was real fun. It was great. It was great. I you, man. It's great to go out as well and, and have a summit to eat and a catch up. Um, and, you know, I'm, we're all going to come and stay with you soon as well. So we're all, me, not just me, Joe, Steve, Maka, our missuses, our kids, everything. <laughs> we're all going to crash at your house and come to New York for a month. So make sure you clear out the spare room, yeah? Let's do it. Let's do it. I'll get some extra mattress. Sh- the whole the whole shebang. Let's do it. <laughs> Last one. Looking forward to it, brother. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. So uh, we'll get straight into the show today. Of course, uh, one of each is the show where we're going to talk a little bit about one of each part, a slice of your life. And uh, we're going to go straight into it with the first photo. And the first photo will appear on your screen immediately, momentarily, rather. There we are. Here's the first photo of course a uh, couple of things that i want to talk about right off the bat but i'll let you walk us through it talk to me a bit well this is me and brian mcclair who you know who doesn't, anyone doesn't know played for united for quite a long time scored over 100 goals for united won quite a lot of trophies for manchester united this is me and him in manchester city center at a place called the jerk shack um where we've got some jerk chicken the reason i, I chose this photo isn't necessarily because it's me and brian mcclair which is great because me and him went for something sweet i'm fortunate enough to know him um but also, it's 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 sort of like indicative of the fact that I'm I work in the city centre. I'm in Manchester city centre, and now and again we like to go out and grab something sweet, whether that's with United you know, legend like that is, or just a few of us from the office from uh, Stratford Paddock. And I quite enjoy being around the city centre, and it's good to be back out and about after after COVID when we weren't able to for so long. And now sometimes we just go and grab a bite to eat. So yeah. The Jerk Shack's one of the places that's near our office. I don't go there a lot, to be honest with you, but it's, it's a nice place to eat. And there's a few other places as well. And I feel quite lucky that I, I work, and you've been there, John, you know where I work, in the middle of a busy city where there's different places to go and eat. It's not too expensive. I just like the sort of the atmosphere around there. So this is why I chose this picture, because it's a good picture to sort of sum that up. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, there are certain, sometimes, you know, you guys, even on your, even on the live shows at Paddock, sometimes you guys talk about players. I have no idea who they are. You know, I'm not trying to, uh, I'm not trying to raise the point that they're, you know, they're older than me or whatnot, but uh, well, we are, we are a lot older than you. I think sometimes <laughs> I forget that because you've been, because you've been a devils from the day one, like from the start, I forget that you are like quite a lot younger than us because it always feels like you're a similar age because you've been around for on, on the, doing the YouTube stuff as long as we have, but mm-hmm. There's a there's a there's a couple of years between us, isn't it, bro? <laughs> <laughs> Jack, I kind of want to take a moment to talk a little bit about your journalism career. I know you've been in this field for a very very long time. Uh, I, I won't ask how long you've been here, but if you can kind of give us a bit of a, a, a rundown as to you know your decision making process, why you got into journalism, why you got into the field of wanting to discuss a lot about Manchester United, I just feel like you could be the go to Manchester United correspondent on any on any space just because you've been around you've been around doing the thing for so long and that's not to say that you've been around from, from an age no, perspective well, it's, it's more so about your skill set and, and just your expertise every time i hear you talk about Manchester United and i'm sure fans can agree you know you, you've just been in this space for so long so just, just talk to us a little bit about that well it's quite a uh, sort of i'd say a, a different journey than most journalists i um i i didn't do the whole college thing straight away i tried to when i left school and failed smoking things i shouldn't have been smoking and not not dedicating myself to the ac- academia like you meant to uh, so i ended up long story short i ended up working in a warehouse and i was in a warehouse in like my early 20s um working with people that had been there for 30 40 years who hated it and i thought this is you know this is going to be my life this is just going to pan out i'm going to do a job i don't like for the rest of my life if i don't do something about it so when i was sort of mid 20s i went back to college um did an access course went to uni did journalism always with a view to it's weird because it's sort of come around full circle which i'll explain when i got into journalism i didn't really think i want to be a sports or football journalist or i want to talk about manchester united i was a massive united fan i always have been since i was a a kid since as long as i can remember but i wanted to do things like documentaries and and more cutting edge sort of stuff and then when i got into journalism became fascinated with radio journalism one of the modules on my course is radio journalism Wow. And I, I did work experience and work placement and internship, I think you might call it, um, at a local radio station. And when I actually graduated from uni, I ended up getting a job with that radio station just from freelancing and internships and just keep going. I kept going back there until eventually they just gave me a job. So I did that for a number of years. Mainly news, mainly sort of, you know, there's a lot of crime where I, I covered. So it's like crime, press conferences, some of the boring stuff like, you know, polit- political stuff. And then... I did cover United press conferences as well. That was a part of it. United and City press conferences. Obviously, I preferred the United press conferences. So fortunate enough to do a few when Sir Alex was there. Didn't do everyone, but did a few. 
uh, when Louis van Gaal and David Moyes came in, or they, David Moyes sort of banned us after the press conference. He didn't want any radio there. Um, we didn't want our station there, but I did Van Gaal and, and Jose. Um, and then, as you know, I was doing sort of, I got asked to do full-time devils as well, because I had a, when all this was happening, I've always kept my hand in with United stuff. I had like a United blog. I went to a lot of games. Um, so when full-time devils started, they reached out to me, mainly because of my blogging, social media, and a few people knew me and that. And they said, you know, do you want to come on here? So I did a little bit of full-time devils. And then eventually I, I went full-time on full-time devils. I was, went, became like a, was like a content producer. Right. Um, and then, as you probably know, a couple of years ago, a few of us, myself, Stephen Housen, Adam McCall, and Joel Smith, got together, bought the channel because we didn't own it. We just worked on it. We bought it, so now we own it. Changed it to Stratford Paddock. Um, and then the way this has all come full circle is I've actually gone back to uni now. I'm at uni doing a master's in documentary production because wow. that's always something I've been interested in. So it feels like it has come a little bit full circle. So it's a bit long-winded. You know, I graduated when I, uh, from uni when I was 30, started to work as a journalist when I was 30, uh, as a journalist, sorry, when I was 30, now I've got back to uni at the age of 42. But, you know, I, I, don't, I'm not, I don't regret those things. I think in many ways they've helped me because I've got a bit of life experience and I'm fortunate enough to be able to work and go to uni without having too many dramas. So, yeah, it's been a bit of a, a, a strange journey in a way, but one that I've enjoyed. And I've been, like you said, I've been lucky enough to follow United, support United, talk about United, as a journalist at times, cover United, and now doing what I do, speak about United a lot. It's just, I wish we were just a little bit better than we are because the last sort of few months in particular have been a, a bit hard to swallow, but, you know, we're United, we'll bounce back. For sure, for sure. Uh, I want to talk, uh, I, as much as I'd love to sit here and talk about United with you all day, I, this, I want this show to be about Jay Motti, so uh, I'm gonna, I'll, hold myself, I'll hold myself back, but maybe okay. before we go on to the next photo, I just wanted to maybe ask, uh, do you have any memories in particular, like in, like any of these like fun times, bad times, one moment in particular during your journalism career, maybe interviewing somebody that you just can't seem to forget and you just, you'll never forget for the rest of your life, anything in particular that, that stands out to you? Well, I t you don't want to make it about United, so I won't say it. I will give an honourable <laughs> mention to the fact that I did interview Sir Alex Ferguson, which was the greatest two minutes and 37 seconds of my life. It was right. a, a premiere, and, and that was phenomenal. But we won't make it all about Manchester United. Mm -hmm. um, it's weird because I've interviewed quite a lot of politicians. I've interviewed Prime Minister a couple of times when it was David Cameron. I interviewed oh, wow. him. I don't want to start name dropping, but it was, it was you know, that is a sort of a moment where you think, okay, you know, you, you're speaking to the, the, the leader of the country. It's quite a big thing. Jeremy Corbyn as well. When he was um, when he was um, leader of the opposition, but what I used to like when I was a journalist, what I used to love is, is the sort of human interest stories, the local heroes almost. You know, people that have done stuff for charity or local people who've managed to, to sort of change their community. I used to do a lot of stories around that. I used to meet a lot of inspirational people, but I've also had some strange moments as well. I remember um, once, and this is just a story that st stays with me. There was a, there's a group in England, uh, in the UK, called the EDL, the English Defence League, and they're just mm. basically Nazis, just right-wing <laughs> morons who, uh -huh. you know, I don't even know if they still exist. I think they might do, but there's not many of them, and they just want binning, putting on I the see. scrap heap of, uh, of human history where they belong. And I, I, when I was first started out as a reporter, I got asked to cover an EDL rally. Now, these are just right-wing, Islamophobic, racist mm -hmm. muppets, and you can keep that, and you don't get sued for saying that, trust me. That okay. is a fact. Right? <laughs> don't worry about like, the legal ramifications of what I've just said. You can say that one on because that's what they are. And um, but because I was quite, you know, I was new to, the, to to reporting, and also I had that sort of I'm not being intimidated attitude. So they sent me on this rally in a place called Rochdale in Greater Manchester, where it's the biggest EDL rally ever. And Rochdale had a a bit of a, a, a sort of there was a story about grooming gangs and stuff. So they sort of targeted this, and we're going to go and stoke up some anti-Islam sort of, or anti-Muslim sentiment and try and tap into this sort of nonsense that doesn't really exist. It wasn't really existing. They tried to find something that wasn't there. So they went there, and I got asked to cover it. And what I didn't think to myself is, we were never going to put these people on the air. We were never going to use their sound bites or whatever. But I didn't think that. So I was interviewing them all. So I'm there with a microphone in the middle of all these basically skinhead, you know, <laughs> sort of right-wing, <laughs> aggravated people who have all been drinking and they're like, yeah. And I'm in the middle, like, tell me, uh, like, being, like, proper provocative as well. Everyone thinks you're racist, are you? You know, that sort of stuff. Tell me, you prove you're not. And um, I remember the first guy I came to, who, like, I, 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 I spoke to, because the police and everything, and, like, you shouldn't have even done what I did. Right. You know, you not going to go, he's like, and all this other nonsense. 
And I suppose I remember the first person I spoke to, I said, like, you know, tell me about why you're here today or whatever. And people think you're, you know, you're racist and, and how would you answer that allegation or whatever. And he said to me, I never forget, and he said it with deep sincerity, he went, we haven't got a problem with you lot. It's the Muslims we don't like. Which is just the most <laughs> ridiculous <laughs> statement ever. Because A, you've just shown yourself to be a proper Muppet. B, how do you know I'm not Muslim, for starters, I could be. Right, and right. C, what does that even mean? What is <laughs> we haven't got a problem with you lot. It's them what we don't like. What's that? What's oh. you lot? So, uh, you know, it was just one of those moments where you're like, oh my God, what am I dealing with? And then when I, I did all this, nearly got my head kicked in, went back to the office with my audio, loads of these interviews, and my boss was like, it's great, but we can't use any of it. Right. Because we're not going to put these on air. Because we're right wing idiots. Why would we? And I thought, oh yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think of that. Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I hate to cut it off there, but we got to move on to the next uh, photo here. You, you need, I, need, I need some juicy stories on this one. I've got to explain it. Again, this feels like I'm just sort of, this is like I'm like that that geezer off of the, the Chelsea fan, Frank Kalina. I'm just saying your pictures of me with different people like I'm stalking him. <laughs> I'm not. Forgive me, right? It's just, this, these are pictures I had on my Instagram or on my social media where it reminds me of something or it's a, because I don't usually take to ten pic, uh, tend to take pictures of just random things. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And this this is sort of leads to a bigger story. So this was when I was in South Africa for the World Cup in 2010. This is actually on a day out to the Apartheid Museum. Um, wow. where I bumped into um, Carlos Valderrama, who used to play for Colombia as a you know, midfielder in the um, late 80s, uh, the 80s and, and early 90s. Um, one of the best midfielders of his generation, fantastic footballer. The reason I concluded this was because you asked about a place and... I went to South Africa in 2010. It was part of like a, almost like a workshop type thing. I was just finished uni and they sent a few of us over there and we worked with some um, South African students, some American journalists, some South, um, some Chinese students all in this newsroom and we covered stories around the World Cup being in South Africa. So it wasn't football stories as such. It wasn't like, oh, you know, um, I don't know, Lionel Messi scored a goal or whatever, or Brazil have beaten, you know, South Africa. It was more about what, how the World Cup being in South Africa was affecting South Africans, people in the South African community and, and around that, that area. And we were in Johannesburg um, and I went to a place like the, the Apartheid Museum, which was just eye-opening. You know, you go in, the, you can go in like some of the cells that used to keep people in. And I may or may not have been in a British cell at one time or another, John, but let me put it this way. There's the cells that they had on in South Africa were unreal. You could barely fit in them. And it was amazing that like, they put people in them. And it was just eye-opening. And also I got to meet a lot of great people, fantastically friendly people in South Africa. I was there for about six weeks. It was one of the best summers, six weeks of my life. Loved it. Loved meeting different people. I had some real experiences where I look back and think, I was so fortunate to, to do that. Um, and yeah, it just reminds me of a, a really good summer. Um, and it was one of those, like the football, I didn't really care about. To be honest with you. I'm not a massive England fan. England did what England do and just flopped in a major tournament, but I had one of the, the best times of my life and met some great people who, you know, I'm still in touch with now via social media. So that just reminds me of that time. Yeah, that's, that's great. Uh, I feel like, I feel like when you do travel and when you go to all these different places and experience new things, and it opens up a different perspective in life. I know a lot of, uh, particularly friends of mine in particular who aren't that fond of traveling, but I think, I think for me, at least, I think it's imperative that, you know, you go out and see new things and learn new things and experience new things, because I think I think that's really crucial in terms of understanding a bit more about what it means to be human. But uh, going back to the whole Valderrama thing, I mean, that's a that's a crazy um, that's a fun person to meet in particular. I don't know why. I, I don't know why Rene Higuita came up in my head. But yes, the, scorp- <laughs> the, the famous infamous Scorpion goalkeeper. Yeah, yeah, I don't know why he was part of that scene, to be fair. He mm-hmm. was part of the 90 sort of the late 80s, early 90s um, Colombia team. But Valderrama was like the star. He actually played against United for, I think it was Montpellier. He was in the 1991 Cup, in his Cup semi or the quarterfinal. Wow. Um, and we played, England played against Colombia in 98, I think he played in, against us. But he, by then he was, he, was, he was on his way out. But he was a great player. And it just we saw him and I, I recognised him straight away because of his, his hairdo, he's Barnet, basically. His hairdo stands out. And I'm like, oh my God, it's Carlos Valderrama. And I was like, and I was with a lot of people who just didn't have a clue who he was because I'm a bit old. I was a bit older than them, and you know, I remembered him, and we went over, and he was like, it's dead friendly, and it was, it was great, and it just summed up that that whole summer and that whole World Cup. We had all these warnings and these horror stories about South Africa. You get robbed, you get mugged. Right. It's like a war zone, and it was just nonsense. We went over there, and it was so friendly to people over there. I got to enjoy some great experiences. Played in a there was a, a football tournament we went to in Soweto. 
where we got to play in this tournament um, against some of these South African players and play with these South African South African um, guys who are really talented, really skillful, and I'm not. So I was just like sitting at the back defending and just giving out bits, you know, um, motivational speaker. You know what I mean? Like, great ball, keep going, lads. Keep the champagne football flowing, boys. That's the one. Get stuck in and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> um, but it was just great. There was loads of great experiences there. Um, I, I really fell in love with, with the, the, the country of South Africa and what they've been through and the way they've come through it. I don't think you can find a country anywhere on earth and includes America in this and no disrespect to you, John, but you'll know better than I do what America's been through in terms of having that divisiveness, having that sort of racial disparity and coming through it. And I'm not saying it's perfect. There's still issues there now and I think there's issues flared up recently. But to be able to reconcile reconciliation is literally the word to use and come through it and have a you know a country that has come together in the face of all that after that and is and is, and is able to acknowledge that history not deny it and pretend it didn't happen but go this happened it wasn't you know it was obviously awful it happened and this is how we've, we've moved on from it if that's the right word um and it was just it was it was just fascinating there are still issues that i'm not gonna lie there was issues that i saw i got my eyes opened a little bit where i saw the way certain sets of people looked at other sets of people which you know was was the it was one of the first times well, not the first time but one of the biggest times where i'd seen you know mixed race people looking down at, at darker people because that's sort of the the, the, the way the, the the get up that went on there i was a little bit like wow but on the whole it was just it's a wonderful country and some fantastic people in there and they welcomed us with with open arms and it was just great and we met working on a newsroom doing all these stories and by the, the the first week we were there at first in the in the in the office straight away dead diligent and by the, the second week we were turning up three hours late hung over and by the <laughs> third, third week we weren't even turning up we were just it just became a big holiday so i apologize to that south african uh newsroom <laughs> but yeah my work ethic wasn't what it should have been <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a fantastic story before we move on maybe one last question for you is there any place in particular right now that you'd like to visit i'm not just saying this because of you mm -hmm. but i've always wanted to go to new york um there's two places i want to go there's japan and new york but new york um i think me and my missus have spoken about it and if we can ever you know palm the kids off with someone then we might like we'd like to come there i think for even just a long weekend just the two of us maybe um, because I've been to America, I've been to the West Coast, and I've been to Vegas, um, but I've never been to New York, and I'd love to go. Um, and also, this is a bit geeky, but I'd like to go to Washington. I'm a bit of a fan of American politics. Bit, one of my courses when I was at uni was American politics. I've always been fascinated by it. been watching the the you know the Judge Jackson hearings all week, and my missus is like, what is this you're watching? What is this nonsense? Why are you watching like this? You're getting home and watching eight hours of this, of just men shouting at this woman. What is it? And I'm like, oh, it's the Judge Jackson here. Is it the Supreme Court justice? He's like, I don't want to know. Like, just leave you to it. So I wouldn't mind going to Washington as well. But yeah, New York's top of my list. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, uh, Just a quick little throw. I'm going to throw this in for you guys. If you guys are uh, listening at home, if you guys are a younger generation or older, I think um, Jay mentioned the word reconciliation uh, before we move on. I just want to say it's very important that you recognize your history and you recognize the past and and heal and part of that is the healing process and i think it's very important that you discuss these things going forward and and try to have a bit of an open mind when it comes to these things i think uh jay went to south africa uh, there's a comedian by the name of trevor noah who's obviously now here based in america but he talks a lot about his time in south africa and his uh and his, and his experience with our our partha apartheid sorry <clears throat> so i think it's very important that you uh if you're listening at home and you don't know about these things you should take a minute to maybe look into it study it which has just kind of understand what's been going on in the past um but yeah uh, we're gonna move straight forward to the the, the final photo and i think this should be a, a nice little fun one all right jay talk to us about this this is this is so sweet but talk to us about this this is um i think i might be wrong i think this is around locked lockdown times or just coming out of lockdown around covid times and um I forgive, I apologize as well. I should have sent you a picture with, with my missus on as well. It's not like I'm a single, <laughs> oh. like I'm a single parent now, I'm not. Um, there is a family unit that is, uh, my missus is the head of that family unit. So apologies to her. Um, and I don't want to get all schmaltzy and overly sentimental, but oh, I'm, a, I'm a family man and I'm very fortunate to have a, a wonderful family. And it's the reason I do what I do, you know, it keeps me going. And um, we've, we've all been through a tough time and, and in a, in a weird way, you know, with, when I say we've all been through a tough time, I mean, with lockdown and COVID and everything, and I've always been a bit of a workaholic since since we started the family. I've, I've worked long hours. I've always, when I was reporting, I was doing long hours. Um, and 
in lockdown, I spent more time with my family than I've ever spent with them. And, and you know, that's sad to say, but it's true because we were literally in the house constantly for a few months and then I went back to work. But it was great as well because, you know, like I said, I'm, they are crazy to do me head in a lot of the time, but I'm lucky. And I've been through a lot, John. I'm not going to lie to you. You know, I think you know my, my story. I was, you know, I am a recovering alcoholic. I, was, I had drug, drug uh, abuse problems, but I'm, you know, God willing, um, whatever you call it, higher power willing, I should say. Um, in June, I'll be eight years sober. And a big part of that is my family, you know, like everyone's different. Nothing can make you stop doing what you're doing. It's, you know, everyone has a different reason. And I tried lots of different ways and uh, nothing really stuck. And, and it's through my family that I was able to sort of, you know, given a reason that made it stronger, a strong enough reason that made me stop doing what I was doing, focus my life, become the sort of person I, you know, I strive to be. And, and I'm, yeah, I feel very lucky. And, you know, our house is, is crazy. They never shut up. They never, ever stop talking. I'm amazed that they've got the mouths closed there because <laughs> all three of them are constantly talking. Honestly, John, it's a nightmare. They just, as soon as they wake up, they're talking. As soon as they go to bed, they just talk till they go to sleep. So you never get a word in their ways. But it's great. And it's, it's you know, we're, we're very fortunate, me and my missus, to have um, a busy family that, that's, you know, it's, it's good to be around. And, yeah, I just thought I'd include that because... I'm not, I don't play my cards close to my chest on 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 devil on paddock. Sorry, I do. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I talk about my family and all that, but it's not something I talk about a lot. Of do you know what I mean? I, re- I reference them and I refer to them, obviously. Um, but coming on your channel and I'm in a chat about three things, and that's a big part of my life. So you're going to talk about like it, food and and uh, <laughs> travel. I thought, why not give those people that live in my house a little mention as well? Eh? You, know I mean? you have to give them a bit of a shout. Yeah, out. Do you know I mean, a little acknowledgement <laughs> just at the end of the, of the show. Uh-huh. So yeah, I thought <laughs> well, I would. Well, there's there's uh, three beautiful children there. Uh, I want to speak a little bit about the the junior, uh, the the boy. Does he kind of remind you you of yourself a bit? Big time. My my mum loves it, right? Because he's a bit of a nightmare. My son, he's a great kid. He is, but he does like he, he's just he never again. He never stops talking. He's <laughs> hyper. He's not like you know whatever you think. He's just, he's like he's not medically diagnosed with anything. <laughs> he's just giddy. He's just mad giddy. He just never shuts. Always bouncing around. And my mum always laughs her head off because I say things to him that she used to say to me. And he says, wow. like, it's just watching you. He's like, well, I used to have to pull with you, you. And now it's like, it's come around full circle. So, yeah, he's he's the middle one. He's And he's, he's, his younger sister uh, is even worse than him. She's like proper got main character syndrome. Like she <laughs> never, ever shuts up. Anything is about her. Honestly, whatever she does... It's like, you know, she's, she'll literally walk into the room, whatever's going on, she's straight in the middle of everyone. If you're having a group discussion, she's straight in the middle of it all. Honestly, it, she's, um, yeah, she's, she's, they're all full of beans. They're all dead giddy. But they, they, they just talk your ears off, bro. Seriously, like, I talk for a living and they put me in the shade. So, yeah, they're all, they're all crazy, man. But it's all good. That's great. That's great. I always wanted to, uh, I mean, I'm not trying to sound depressing, but, when I was in college, I thought, you know what? I probably have a family of myself, 26, 28. Um, I've passed that. Um, still no family, still no missus. Uh, so hopefully John, that'll John, come. John, right? 33. I didn't, I mean, I was, I think, yeah, I didn't have any, I don't know why I think I know. Didn't have any kids. I didn't, you know, I didn't settle down. And by the time I was 36, I had three kids and that was it. My life was over. So, <laughs> joking. So, though it's, you know, 20 in your 20s. One thing I like about you, John, and what I wanted to say this earlier when we were talking about travel is, you know, you, you're not afraid to go and travel on your own and do stuff on your own. I used to like doing that now and again. Do you know what I mean? And you know, going and experiencing new things, and you've got a lot of friends all over the world and making the most of that. So while you've got that opportunity, yeah, do that because before you know it, like that, you'll have, you know, you'll have an house full of kids and you'll have to plan. If you want to go out to the shop, you have to plan it, let alone going out, you know, oh. across the Atlantic. <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> Trust <dumb>. me. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Hey, Jay, I just wanted to thank you. I, I always wanted to have a uh, sit down. I didn't even get it. We were so busy. We didn't have a chance to really sit down and talk when I visited Manchester, but we definitely, definitely should see each other in person in the flesh one very soon. We have to. And uh, hopefully we'll um, spend a little, more, a little bit more time together. John, you're that rare person, right? Trust me. Me, Steve, Maka, and Joe, right? A, a four of the most miserable men you will ever meet, right? <laughs> We hate the world. We're cynical. <laughs> we're jaded. We've just, you know, we've had it. The life kids kicks the, the, the happiness out of a lot of us, right? <laughs> and we see the worst in everyone. And the one thing we all agree on, we've all got nothing but love for John Shin. Honestly, when you came, we were all buzzing. And to find someone that all four of us actually really like is a, is a rarity. <laughs> you know what I mean? 
<laughs> so we're all that. right. John Zane is great. Honestly, we've got nothing but good things to say about him. I think that's a testament, man. You're one of the good guys. So always a pleasure chatting to him. You're right. We, you know, hopefully we can do it in your city next time. Come over to you. <laughs> Please, I will. I will take over New York City for this trip, trip from Paddock family. Let's we want. We want to do. We want to do. We were talking about this the other day, and we actually want to do. Come over and watch a game in like a different city, all four of us, mm-hmm. and do like a you know bit of content around it and meet. So a good start would be New York. So hopefully we can we can get that sorted sooner rather than later. Now we're all out back to travel without too many dramas. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, Jay, thank you so much. Uh, where can uh, where can people find you if they if they don't know how to find you? Where do you think they can find you? Um, you know, it's well, if you don't know, it's fine. I'm on Strep for Paddock if you didn't see Manchester United content and stuff. Uh, Jay Milty on socials, on Twitter and Instagram and all that stuff. My Instagram is just pictures of me and the kids, though, and, and me running, so that's pretty boring. Don't look too much into <laughs> that, just to give you a warning. <laughs> all right, Jay, thank you so much. We'll chat again real soon. Thank you. Thanks for having me, John.